you everybody for joining us today on this uh, uh, what is it Thursday <laughs> Thursday afternoon. Uh, so today I have an amazing guest, Bill Bolden, who will cover the topic of launching a startup, launching a product, and cover a lot of different technical questions on the um, uh, in, in in the presentation. And um, uh, Bill, if you can tap to the next slide. So this uh, webinar um, is a part of the series that I uh, put together that features different uh, entrepreneurs, different experts in the tech design startup industry. And the idea and the, the mission behind this series is to uh, help entrepreneurs, uh, help non-technical founders, people that work in their first uh, startup launching the uh, launching and building their first product is to help them to understand what the proper process looks like, what that process looks like from start to finish, and the uh, the, the goal is that by the end of the series you will have a understanding of what it takes to build, launch, scale products, raise money, and um, you know successfully grow the company. And here are the few examples of the topics that we will cover. Uh, in a series, um, and so today we're talking about building MVPs, uh, the future topics that we will have coming up, pitch decks that close VC deals, how to make your product go viral, um, sales, how to find the customers, how to close the sales, how to go from zero to 10K MRR uh, to 100K MRR, which is the monthly recurring revenue. So if those questions uh, or the topics you know, relevant to you, um, stay tuned for more, uh, for, for the upcoming webinars, so upcoming dates. So now that, you know, we, uh, we, 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 we can send you follow-up updates and, uh, you know, now that we have your emails to keep you posted on this series. So, and if there are any questions or topic that you would like us to cover, please let me know. Uh, and I'd be happy to bring in those uh, future guests to cover those topics. So, uh, well, with that said, um, I'd love to introduce our today's speaker, Bill Bolden. Uh, Bill and I, we've been working for many years on a variety of different projects and the startups and seen startups going successfully from zero to their first paying uh, clients. And um, so, yeah, with that said, I will pass uh, mic to Bill and uh, uh, let them take the stage. <laughs> Well, hello. Um, so I'm Bill Bolden. You can read about me on this slide, um, along with this great photo of me, 20 pounds and much pinker hair ago. Um, I do need to update the list of the things I'm fractional CTO of. Uh, I'm still with Kitsch, Quan, and Studious, no longer with Hello Audio, Let's Collect, and Founder Corner, but also now with Dovey Dates and Book with Tote. So the list is always changing because um, I take the startups on, see their product through to launch and completion, and then uh, move on. So um, always changing where I'm fractional CTO. And in my spare time, I'm the EDM artist known as Down Up Right. You can find me on all major music services. Okay, um, so let's talk today about the path to prod. Um, so the first thing we're going to establish is if you want to do Figmas first or proof of concept first. And then we're going to talk about fundraising on Figmas, pre-proving out your marketing strategy, and having a highly opinionated framework and showing up with an army. Um, so the first thing you're going to have to decide as you begin your journey with your startup is if you need to build a proof of concept for your secret sauce or if you can go straight to Figmas. And just um, checking in with the uh, audience, Lena, does everyone here know what a Figma is? Uh, that's a good question. Let's briefly cover it in case. Uh, Take it away. They're more your thing than mine. Sure, yeah. So Figma is a design tool. Uh, that's something that we're using uh, on our side with Forkota to create the designs and interactive prototypes for uh, applications. So in the reason why we love Figma is it's a great uh, it's a great tool that create br creates a bridge between designer and design and development teams uh, and also the product teams because it allows you to create designs very effectively uh, very quickly to create interactive prototypes that you can present to your customers and then 
pass that information to the developers in a way where they can copy CSS styles in the code and paste it into you know whatever uh, framework they're working in. So it just helps to accelerate the process and make it so much more streamlined. So it's uh, um, uh, uh, like it, and they, they just got acquired by Adobe, so now they're going to be part of the Adobe suite, I guess. But uh, yeah. Yeah, and the important thing is that Figma's once they're built out in an interactive, clickable fashion, they handle just like a real app. They're not the real app, but they're indistinguishable from it. Um, so the first step is if your idea is exploratory or technically ambitious, you should do the minimum work necessary to prove that it can actually work. So a good example is let's say you're designing a wearable. Well, maybe you can buy a Raspberry Pi which is a very small computer that's like this big and just wear it manually on your person for a few weeks to test that your wearable does the thing you want it to do. Um, or maybe you have an idea for AI generated cooking recipes. Well, before you go to design your whole site for what it's going to look like and how it's going to work, you should probably generate some AI generated cooking recipes first and make sure you don't blow up your kitchen. And then in the third example here, I've got a blockchain example. So if what you're doing is technically ambitious, like you have an idea for a product that's going to use AI to do such and such, you need to start there. But if your product is what I like to think of as paint by numbers, like it's a well-tread space. Um, you can uh, you can hop right in and start with Figmas. So um, it's easy to jump straight to the screen showing all your beautiful features, but um, you need to consider that before you can even get to that screen, you have to solve the same dozen boring problems that every app has to solve. So um, let's say you want to make an app where people who have rabbits to sell can meet people who want to buy rabbits. This isn't technically ambitious. We're not doing anything AI related. Um, so it's easy to start designing the gorgeous app with all the rabbits in it. But before you do that, you need to figure out these basics. Log in, log out, and forgot password. Payment information account settings, report a problem or harassment, privacy policy, delete my account. I've launched over a dozen products and I find that founders often overlook these very basic screens because they want to get straight to the fun stuff. Lena, what do you think? Okay, I'm muted. Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely usually an afterthought uh, in application, but like you said, that's a very core functionality that uh, we need to keep in mind as well. Yep. Um, but you have to watch out when you're making these figmas and making this beautiful design of what I call the hidden functionality design. So here's a joke I often tell. The UI UX spec for the first release of Google is that first there's a box and then there's a list of results. Easy peasy, should be easy to implement. It's just two screens. One screen has a box you can type in, the second screen has a list of answers. What do you mean it's hard to build? It's only two pages. Um, so that what the, what I'm saying with that is that sometimes it's very easy to put controls on the screen that actually have a real heavy impact on your devs. And so what you should have is a knowledgeable coder on hand, such as myself or one of my peers, um, who can go over the design and be like, this part's easy, this part's easy, this part's easy, this part's hard. So you're making, um, let's say you're making a dating app and there's a list of matches near you, that's easy. And then there's a section that says recommended matches for you. Easy enough to edit how it looks. It looks just like the other section, but all of a sudden a programmer is thinking like, whoa, how, why are these recommended? Are we doing machine learning? Is there an algorithm? Is there a concierge service? What's happening? 
Um, and so you need to have a coder around who can look at your spec and make sure you're not accidentally building in like, oh, this checkbox, this checkbox is as hard to build as the whole rest of the app is. What do you think about that, Lena? Yeah, and sometimes to add to that, even introduce an additional design feature, like for example, the project we're working on right now, the client wanted to add uh, just like a notification feature or like a reminder, but that would affect so many more screens outside of the screen that we were just working on, like the user settings, some project settings. So we, whenever we work on the projects, we consistently have to remind the clients, keep it simple and uh, yeah, making sure that we're not getting into the scope creep by adding too many wish list items that might look simple in the moment, but as you mentioned, affect so much more behind the scenes, even, even when it comes to design. Okay, so at this point, you've, um, you've got some clickable figmas. They look real. You've specked out what your app looks like. Now it's okay to fundraise off your figmas. And this is what I tell people, is a lot of people think they have to build their app and then show it off to people how it's all built. They don't. If you're hopping on calls with um, VCs or doing pitch competitions, you can include screen caps of your Figmas just as easily as you can include screen caps of your real app. So um, the thing is, is you can make Figmas uh, much cheaper than you can make the real app. So speaking from experience, it's time to put some numbers on it. Having been through this process many times, your app is going to take somewhere between 50 grand and 300 grand to build. I'm saying that from experience, having quoted dozens of projects. Um, but for 15K, you can get through the steps of mood boards, design, and two solid Figma sprints. You can be looking really good and like you're a real app. Um, you can show off the latter as easily as the former to an investor. Um, and what this is really valuable for is that your investors are going to push back on you and be like, ooh, you know, I would invest, but only if it does thing X. Now you're in a position, well, first, in, in those cases, I often say, you know, don't change up your whole app just just because one investor wants it to be different. But maybe it's someone you can't say no to. Maybe it's for a half a million dollar check. Um, it is so much easier to go back to your designer and say, please make one more screen that, that has this new feature than it is to go back to your developer and be like, please change how the app works. It does this now. And if I can show for a second, if we can take over the screen, I can show uh, a quick example of what the Figma prototypes look like. So yes, um, sure. let's see, how do I? I'll stop I... sharing, you can share. Okay. okay, I think I need to make a, to become a presenter one second. Okay, this is, I'm, I'm learning as I'm doing this. Okay, share screen, all righty, cool. All righty, so yeah, here's an example of the, of the one of the prototypes that we created. So as you can see, this is all clickable, like certain areas, you know, we get the drop downs, we get uh, pop-ups, you know, we can make a selection of something on the screen. So in this case, some information is being automatically pre-populated, but it can be as uh, robust as you want it to be. So for example, yeah, here we have options of drop down menus of, let's see what else we have. Um, editing tools. So really, yeah, you can, and there is no logic behind the screens. This is just a bunch of images interconnected with each other, but you can make it look and feel just precisely as a completed uh, product. And uh, as Bill mentioned, much, much quicker and uh, um, uh, but more budget efficiently. So, uh, all righty, so let me go back and, uh, okay, Bill, if you wanna take, take over from here. Mm -hmm. So um, like Lena was saying, uh, as far as seeing that stuff on your screen goes, um, it looked like a fully built out app. You don't know the difference. So you're not lying to the investors. You're just telling them, this is what we're building. This is our vision. And if they can see it, they can believe it. 
And so what this is saying to them is when you write me this check for $25,000, you're going to be doing that so that this theory you see right now can become a reality. But they might come back and say, we need to see more traction. This is where um, now that you have Figmas, you can start to pre-prove out your marketing strategy. And this is something that Lena can speak to because I know a whole nother webinar was about ways to market, validate your idea before you start taking the plunge. Well, that's even more powerful once you've got screens. Um, so here are some tried and true strategies that I've used to help market my apps while they're still being built. So for B2C or mobile apps, you can have a wait list. So this is real easy. You make a web page in Squarespace, Wix, or Webflow, whatever you're most comfortable with, that harvests email addresses um, that says, this is coming in October. Sign up now to be notified when it's live. If nobody signs up, it's possible your idea doesn't have appeal and maybe you should pump the brakes. With any luck, you get a couple hundred signups and you can feel a lot safer knowing that you've got that many people who are excited for your product. Now, specifically for social products, social networks or um, community building apps, I like to encourage people to try to build out a Discord, a Slack, or a Reddit to a couple thousand members before they try to um, get everyone on their app. Because this has a real problem where if you're making a social app, it's pretty useless to the first person who signs up. So you need to find a way to get a community of a couple thousand people ready to go. And you can actually um, get a head start on your content moderation policies by trying to build out a Discord, a Slack, or a Reddit, where you'll already be answering the hard questions like, what do I do about people who go off topic? What do I do about people who self-promote? What do I do about people who such and such? Is it okay? Is it not okay? You'll be figuring those things out ahead of time, and then you can build those into your app. Um, you can test out cold traffic theories. So if you're doing a wait list, you can start to run Instagram or Facebook ads for that wait list. Um, and you can establish your CAC which is your customer acquisition cost early. You can say, mm, it's costing us about $30 in signups for every person, or $30 in ads for every person who signs up for the wait list. Is that sustainable? Can we make this product work if it's a $9.99 a month product? We're gonna have to maintain every customer for three months minimum to make our money back on our ads if it's costing us $30 to acquire every customer at $9.99 a month. Um, and then a real dangerous one is selling lifetime licenses. This is more of a fundraising approach and I've seen it bite people before, but you basically offer a Wumbo size lifetime, all features paid forever subscription in exchange for signing up in advance. Like this product is coming in December and for $500 now, you can be one of the first users and be guaranteed a lifetime guarantee. Um, I have seen companies that have had to go back on lifetime licenses and it's not pretty. So do that with care. Um, any thoughts on any of these strategies, Lena? Yeah, I wanted to add with the, um, the validating cold traffic, I do like that method a lot. And even to take it one step back, before you start validating the cost of uh, customer acquisition, you can actually validate your target audience, whether your, mess, you know, your uh, messaging resonates with your users. Are you solving the problem that resonates with the users? Because if you put an ad for... Uh, I, 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 I don't know, like the, 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 the dating app for, um, I don't know, professionals living in a only specific zip code or like uh, people in a specific profession, right? 
and you're not getting any traffic. So either, right, it gives you an idea. Maybe your uh, the size of your target audience is too small. Maybe the problem is not that important or non-existent. Maybe your, your, your messaging does not resonate. So it's much easier, again, to tweak it and see what gets the most clicks, most attention, most conversions. And then once you got that, um, you know, because it's all about getting traction before selling, before you build it, right? So that's uh, where the ads and the technical traffic is super valuable and very cost effective. Now, here are some strategies for B2B platforms. So if you're B2B, um, you're going to have to do more direct sales than, uh, than social sales. So um, you can actually start getting signed letters of intent. Let's say you're a B2 university project. Um, you're making something where your target market is higher ed. Well, um, you're not going to run an Instagram campaign only targeting deans of higher ed institutions. What you're going to do is you're going to go get those contacts manually. You're going to pitch them your Figmas, and you're going to get a signed letter of intent where the person says, you know, it is my intent. We're on board to buy this if, um, if you build it. Uh, and a, a letter of intent usually says that it's done by such a date and we intend to pay this much. Um, so, you know, by October, if this is done, it is our intent to build it. This stuff is gold to investors because if you can come back to an investor and you can say, I have 30 signed letters of intent, then that's taking all the guesswork out of their decision to give you their money to build the product. You've already succeeded. Um, you can activate your network, which of course is LinkedIn, Twitter, and your professional contacts. It can be really powerful to make strategic partnerships, like for instance, getting in an app store. So some of my startups I've worked for have had huge success getting inside the Zoom marketplace or something as an app you can install for, for Zoom then you're getting all the eyes of that um you're getting all the eyes of that bigger institutions user base on you and they'll be like oh hmm what's this app do i'll install that for my zoom and now there's a huge benefit to being in that partnership and then here's another approach you can also augment with consulting before the product is ready so multiple startups that i've worked for have been made by an industry leader who has a singular vision in a certain vertical. And um, that industry leader can pre-sell a lifetime license, but also make it so that like with your purchase of the lifetime license, you also get a bonus day of consulting from them. It's a way to put your thought leadership to use. Any thoughts on these, Lena? No, that's that all sounds great. So you're starting to show it to people, and I like to specify some feedback that sounds nice, but they're not going to buy it versus they're going to buy it. So on the left, we have feedback that people will say to be nice doesn't mean they're going to buy it. If they say, I would use this, mm. on the right-hand side, they are envisioning buying the product already. So if they're saying, how much is this going to cost me? or how soon is this available, or does it integrate with my Slack? They're in a place where in their head, they're already thinking through the implications of using it. That's the feedback of someone who's gonna buy. If someone is like, oh, this is cool, um, they're not visualizing themselves using it. Uh, have you found this to be true, Lena? Definitely. Yeah, when people are curious about the cost and how it's actually going to work is definitely uh, they more like when they're asking more engaged questions, and thoughtful questions, that's a good sign. Right. Questions where you can tell they're in a headspace where they're already using it. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to get a little technical. We're going to talk about having a highly opinionated framework. All the problems have been solved except your secret sauce. So one of the talents that I have is I know of 
dozens and dozens of tools that are labor savers when you're building out new apps because there's a SaaS for everything. Um, so a highly opinionated framework is a programming solution that strongly suggests certain ways of solving common problems and integrating with favored third-party services so that things just work out of the box. A great example is Next.js, which is one of many JavaScript frameworks. Well, Next.js is configured to work out of the box on Vercel with one command. If you choose Next.js as your language, you've already decided where you're going to host your website. You'll be hosting it on Vercel because all you have to do is type next deploy and now it's on Vercel. Another great example is how the serverless framework interacts with AWS Lambda. Um, if you're using the serverless framework, it's a given that you're using Lambda. You don't need to spend any time integrating things or making things work. You can get straight to writing the first line of code. Um, for a long time, Ruby on Rails was the premier highly opinionated framework, but the ones that are hot now is Next.js, Django, Serverless, and AWS Amplify. Um, so developers love to configure stuff, myself included. I love working on templating languages that generate code that write other templating languages. That's not the same thing as building out that rabbit viewing product that is like literally steps taken delivering features to customers. So a highly opinionated framework will put your developers in a position where they don't have to waste time configuring things because all the decisions have already been made for them. So here is some stuff that a good highly opinionated framework uh, will do for you. Um, you shouldn't have to configure any deploy scripts. You shouldn't have to configure your own style scripts. Uh, you shouldn't have to manage orchestration or environments. You don't have to write your own authentication logic anymore. You don't have to write your own payment processing code anymore. You don't have to write your own messaging code anymore or your own jobs queuing system. And you really shouldn't have to design emails and like by code, by hand. It's a big time sink. The best highly opinionated framework is the one that your senior or full stack has worked in for multiple projects. Get you somebody who knows their way around a particular highly opinionated framework. But don't go niche. You have to be able to hire for the future. So on the left-hand side, I have some very commonly seen. So I'm in a position where I'm hiring very often. Um, I'm always hiring new devs for my new startups, and it is very easy to find people who can work in the left-hand side. The software on the right-hand side is arguably more powerful and better. Like um, Elixir and Scalia are probably just better than JavaScript, but they have one one hundredth the number of developers available in the hiring pool. So you're just doing yourself a disservice if you let your first engineer say, oh, I'm going to build this in um, Vue.js with Flutter. And now you've given yourself two very hard hiring decisions for the future. So stick to the stuff on the left-hand side. Bill, would you say that the, the tech staff on the left is the, the one that um, allows startup founders to start fast and scale fast to their projects? Yes. They all, they, these are all start fast and scale fast. And the ones on the right also will start fast and scale fast until you lose your engineer who knew how to use them. And you're suddenly yeah. drawing on a very tiny talent pool. For your yeah, I, I've definitely seen the, the, the startup founders struggling to find the right developers. Um, and then they end up hiring people for, it just turns into multiple people working on a project over the several years and it just turns into the mess. So um, definitely uh, like sticking to the popular tools um, uh, helps to reduce some of those headaches and yeah, finding the developers, making it much easier. So I'm gonna talk about my highly opinionated framework. So this is bill specific. But I've launched a dozen products, um, and I keep coming back to the same set of solutions. So this is going to be a little technical, 
but I'm just going to tell you what those solutions are. So for your front end, I recommend doing a Create React app that compiles down to a static file and is served from an AWS S3 bucket, or you use Next.js and hosted at Vercel. I keep coming back to these two solutions. They're really the only games in town. Easy to hire for, easy to find people who can work on them, and they just work. For your back end, you want to build it decoupled from the front end, and it validates JSON web tokens independently. You want to use what are called API first principles, where you design the API, then you design the front end. Um, and I like to use serverless express node.js running on the serverless framework um, at AWS Lambda. For your database, depending on your needs, if it's a simpler application, you should go with AWS DynamoDB. If it's a more so, complicated application, um, you should go with AWS serverless Aurora Postgres compatible. For DNS and networking, you should buy your domain at AWS using their Route 53 service. It's a great place to um, buy your domain name. Don't use GoDaddy or Namecheap. You're going to wind up having to transfer your domain to AWS eventually to use all the most advanced AWS features. So your domain should really be hosted with AWS from the get-go. Um, plus, GoDaddy is just weird. Um, it's nice and cheap to do it through the AWS account you're already starting. For authentication, so for storing your usernames and passwords and letting people sign in socially, use Auth0. Or if you're using Amplify as your highly opinionated framework, try AWS Cognito because Amplify is highly opinionated that you are using Cognito. So don't fight your highly opinionated framework. Work with it. Amplify wants you to use Cognito, so use Cognito. Okay, here's one I love. For code style, there is a library called semi-standard that makes all the decisions for you on what your code formatting is like, and it applies them across your whole project. So you'll never have a fight between two developers about code formatting again, which is super important. Um, I die a little inside every time I see a PR get rejected because of a variable name not being in camel case. Um, so I heavily endorse semi-standard. For your payment processing, I think you should go with Stripe. They're the clear market leaders in this. They're great for devs to work with. Their fees are acceptable. And they have a product called Stripe Connect that manages payments to third parties, where you take a cut in the middle. If your product involves messaging or voice and video streaming, I highly recommend Twilio or Comet Chat. These are two services that can build messaging and voice calling and video calling into your application without you needing to build it yourself. Have you used either Twilio or Comet Chat, Lena? Uh, we worked with Twilio in the past, yeah. Yeah. For email, I heavily endorse SendGrid. They have a WYSIWYG editor, what you see is what you get, where you drag and drop items into an email template and that email template is guaranteed to look exactly the same in Gmail as it does in Outlook, as it does in Yahoo. So um, that's huge. And you don't have to code those HTML emails yourself. All right. So that was my highly opinionated framework. Those are the tools I use over and over again to make these startups fast and efficient. Now for the last step, showing up with an army. You've fundraised, you've got the specs, you've picked your highly officially, your highly opinionated framework. It's time to execute. So it is time to spend between 25 to 50 grand a month for between two and six months. The big question is, do you go with a dev shop or do you hire in-house? And actually, Lena, um, I'll let you go over this slide because as, as a you know, a design shop, um, you might be more on the side of shops than I am in-house. Yeah, I mean, the advantage of going with the dev shops or the, you know, product, digital product agencies is 
um, like you know, like um, the the slide says, right? You get an instant connection to the talent pool of specialists. The the already uh, you know fully functional team that works well together, and you get uh, access not only to um, you know the the specialists that are looking to hire, maybe just a designer, maybe designer and the product manager, but you get access to all the support behind the scenes that you might be getting the strat product strategy marketing strategy, um, QA specialists, developers. So they, the developer shops can be an extension of your startup where you can let them handle all your uh, product development design strategy and you focus in on fundraising, sales, uh, and the you know, more strategic uh, founder, um, CEO stuff uh, of your company, right? So, and then, um, yeah, um, so that's, and we, we work with a variety of different startups in the exact same model where we join them as their uh, extended arm of their, of their company. Yeah, um, and all that's to be said. I also like hiring in-house as well, um, just because uh, I found that it's a little hard to exit a startup while you're captive to a specific vendor. So by the time you're thinking of exiting your startup, People might want to hear that you have a, ma a team internally who can maintain it, but it is hard to build out that team. Um, it's labor intensive. It takes weeks of hiring. You have to be good at hiring to find the right people. And honestly, um, I tell most of my clients who are taking me on to manage their development, I tell them to use Forcoda because it's just a really direct path to great results. But yes. Whether you go with dev shops or you hire in-house, it's time to start start spending 25 to 50K a month over two to six months. If you are getting estimates for over 300K, you need to go back and define your MVP downward. So um, if you are getting estimates that take longer than six months with higher spend than 50K a month, then you have two big ambitions for your first release. It's not an MVP, it's like a finished product. And so you have to go back and be like, what can we strip away? How can we simplify? How can we get to a lean product that solves one problem really well? The next step is that your designers will stay one step ahead of your developers. So to get to this point, the designers did two to six sprints for you already. You're gonna put them on pause while the developers build everything out. And then as the developers are closing in on being feature complete, you turn your designers back on and you have them stay one sprint ahead of the developers. So while the designers are building sprint seven, the developers are building and bringing to life sprint six, basically. Um, is, that's how you prefer to work too, Lena, right? Always staying one step ahead. Definitely, yes. Yeah. So we have enough time to um, also validate. So what we like to do is once we complete the design sprint, which is usually it can last between two to three weeks, depending on the amount of features that we're designing. So uh, we like to also run user testing or user interviews at the end of each sprint to confirm that the design that we delivered resonates with users, makes sense. Uh, there are no questions or major issues that don't make sense to the users and uh, fix them. Uh, during the design phase, because the further you go in the development process, from the design to the development, like in the development phase, making updates and fixing things can become five to 10 times more expensive. So that's why we try, you know, like do our best to catch, you know, any issues, make those updates in, in the design phase. So that way, once it goes into the development, you're confident that you build in something that resonates with you, your users and uh, you, you know, it's gonna be a great finished product. Yep, and on the next slide, I've got, um, I've got some estimates. Um, so this is the quickest I've ever built something and the longest I've ever been willing to take on. Not that, um, might not obviously sometimes products cost over 180k but at that point they're getting a little long in the tooth for me and um i don't like to agree to build things that take more than six months to build because i think there's a high chance of like the the target moving too many times on you 
but most products I build cost around 60K across 10 weeks. You do have to add in a six week approval delay if your product involves Google, Facebook, or Apple, especially Facebook. There's just this period where they're gonna make you wait um, and you'll have submitted it to the app store and then you're waiting for three weeks and then they come back and say, we didn't like this one thing about your app, you need to change it. And now you're waiting again. So um, just plan for that. Okay, uh, so here is a sample budget for how you might build out your um, team uh, for 30 grand a month. I'll let you read this slide, but this is a sample budget. Um, 30 grand a month buys you a full stack, a fractional CTO, a junior, the continued engagement of your design firm, and all those other tools I mentioned, the SendGrid, the Auth0, the Twilio, that's all gonna be less than 150 bucks. Your AWS bill will be nothing if you use my highly opinionated framework, plus you get loads of credit. Awesome, awesome. So, oh yeah. Um, so um, while we, uh, so yeah, that concludes our, um, the, the the presentation so while we're waiting for uh the questions to be posted in the chat so yeah please let us know what questions you have uh bill quick question for you what are the big trends um that you're seeing in the startup industry at large at the moment yeah the biggest trend is probably um getting less and less code all the time as you begin to um embrace more and more of these no code and low code tools Recently, I've been getting into making startups by just gluing together a type form to an air table to a single Lambda. Um, these no code tools are really powerful. And um, while I don't think it's a good idea yet to try and build your app all the way in bubble, um, it's getting more and more possible all the time. Uh, so I would say that's probably the biggest trend in the startup space I'm seeing. Awesome. That's awesome. So, okay, we have we've got a few questions here. A question from Daniel: What are mood boards? Uh, are those Figma sprints? So, mood boards is the step before the design uh, design sprints. So, a uh, mood board is a collection of different visual references that you know inspire you, or you can send, you can share with your designer as a reference, so that way they understand. Um, in what direction you know they're going to be moving? What your app will look like? Because there are so many different font styles, color palettes, you know, you name it. And uh, so the the goal of a mood board is to narrow down your uh, the vision for how the app will look like. And typically on the project, we put together three distinct, separate uh, mood boards with different design directions to allow clients to pick what they prefer. And then based on, on that, refine the vision further, and then come up with a um, uh, you know, the overall look and feel the, of the user interface. So it's a mood boards are precursor to the actual designs to, you know, to inspire founders and designers. Um, question from Lucy, how do one work around initial traction for a marketplace product? Who comes first, the vendors or the users? Who should uh, a founder focus on? I'm building a marketplace for um, agri, uh, agri business setup resources. So Bill, um, I guess that was a follow-up question to one of the yeah, slides. Um, yeah. So uh, I've built multiple marketplace apps and in general, with few exceptions, you want to solve the supply side first, not the demand side. So you want to get your app built and then, um, Let's say you said agribusiness. So I'm just going to imagine that your uh, your app is for, let's say, people who want to sell livestock, finding places to buy livestock. You want to have the livestock salespeople on there first. And you want there to be enough when you launch that the first wave of people who get on demand side feel like they have some element of choice. So um, you can't try to grow both sides at once. That's a recipe for disaster. Because if I'm the first buyer on the app and there's only two sellers, that's not very exciting. So what you want to do is you want to delay your launch until you've lined up 100 sellers ready to sell. Then you open the floodgate to the buyers ready to buy 
and it feels like a rich ecosystem already. And you might wanna focus on one metro market first. So um, this is where having personal connections really comes in handy. If you're making an app where people can buy and sell livestock, you might wanna start in Wichita. Um, and you would want to have 100 farms in Wichita with inventory to sell, ready to go, communicate to them all, you'll get the go live signal in a few months. And then once you hit 100, go live and then start letting people in to buy. Awesome, thank you. Um, what's your view on providing many services within an MVP, especially for a marketplace? Um, uh, another question from Lucy. I think that an MVP is not a place to provide many services. Your startup should ideally be focused around doing one thing really well. And that is how you come to um, get your first wave of true believers and really impress people, is to excel at that one ask. The opposite end of things is to be an all-in-one. And an all-in-one is when you're a tool that tries to be the one-stop shop for everything a certain um, a certain customer needs. Like let's say you're an all-in-one for daycare centers. And so you're gonna make an app that does scheduling, invoicing the parents, managing communications, um, keeping monitors on their rooms, webcams, et cetera. Now you've built this really high barrier to entry where you're like, well, we can't release until we've built out the first 10 features or else we're not an all-in-one. So I would try really hard to solve one problem effectively before you try to be an all-in-one. And, and then, uh, to add to that, if you focus, if you're trying to buy it, uh, you know, a, a bigger piece, so like too much too soon, and you're spending too much time building it out, your competitors might beat you to the market. So that's why it's important to lock those early customers as quickly as possible to deliver working uh, quality, you know, MVP as quickly as possible to make sure that you ca start capturing the market share because the longer you wait somebody else might beat you to it. So especially if you're in a very highly competitive market like, a, um, you know, crypto, blockchain, uh, NFTs, all that stuff. So, uh, it, you know, in some markets, the speed to market plays a huge role. So uh, another question from Daniel. Can you explain more about how you validate cold traffic theories? Yes. So um, validating cold traffic theories is where you have a theory or a hypothesis you can test. And you can do this before you've gone to the trouble of building your app. You can do it while you're still signing people up for the wait list. So you do that by building a really gorgeous landing page. Just have Forcoda do it for you or use a great template from Squarespace, Wix, or Webflow. Have it look professional and like the product is real and like the product exists. Have people sign up for the wait list. And then your cold traffic theory is, I bet I could run an Instagram ad for this. Well, you don't have to wait and finish your product to find out. You can start by testing an Instagram campaign with a small spend of $50 to $500 and say, I'm going to run a $500 campaign for this waitlist page and see what my CAC works out to. And then you come back to it and you realize now you know your CAC and it's $17. Um, so uh, I am no SEO marketer. That's not my, um, that's not my forte. Uh, I don't know the intrinsic insides of Facebook ad buys versus Google ad buys versus YouTube ad buys. But I'm trying to say that you can get a head start on validating your theory. Like, if I make this clever TikTok influencer campaign, people will respond to it. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, Daniel, if you're interested in learning more about sales and customer acquisition, we're going to have a speaker 
down the line it will be talking about sales and marketing funnels so that will be a great um webinar for you to join so keep an eye on the um emails with the next webinar updates so and uh, another question from daniel love it uh i'm starting a podcast and i was going to purchase a website from hostinger hostgator uh for two years should i get a web hoster as well um the, the the web host yeah so uh there are many podcast hosts such as oh. um hello audio or stitcher or anchor i prefer hello audio on account of i built it that will also give you a podcast homepage as well as hosting your podcast for you so if the main purpose of your podcast homepage is simply to be a place where your podcast lives, those services can do that for you. And I would say that is the easiest way to solve your problem. Um, that said, I still don't love HostGator. I like, um, I like Webflow for building out simple, um, hosted pages, you know, uh, it would be a quick task to search Webflow podcast template and um, see how many ready to go sites there are for hosting your podcast. That's just another way to solve the problem. And of course, nothing can replace um, hiring Lena's excellent people to, uh, to design you something custom. But um, I'm pretty sure that Anchor and Stitcher and Hello Audio all do this out of the box. Um, and the question from um, Shyam, hopefully I pronounced it correctly, from where uh, we can, uh, uh, so are we able to raise the fund? So at what stage, I guess at what stage, the question is that at what stage of the project, the process, MVP building process, um, are we able to raise the funds? Well, um, <clears throat> there's uh, once you have the figmas, you can start hardcore fundraising, but you can begin even before then by attending pitch competitions, which often have five or 10 grand in prizes. So I would start out small by just making some killer slides. And in two weeks, I think Lena's webinar is on how to make slides. Um, yeah, pitch deck, yeah. Two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yep. So make sure you attend that one. Um, but you can make some killer slides, start going to pitch competitions, practice your selling yourself and and getting the the beat down, and maybe walk away with a five or ten grand prize that might let you get your foot in the door with the first step to Figmas. And those Figmas unlock the real first round of fundraising when you can show the investors this is what we're building. It's going to look like this. It's going to behave like this. Do you see now? Do you see the vision? That's when the, the money really unlocks. Yeah. yeah. And the uh, uh, question from Lucy, at what point do you decide to stop working on, on an idea? What signals show that uh, a startup idea is not viable? I would say that if you're doing those steps that I listed in the section, pre-prove your marketing strategy. If you're doing these things and you're not getting adoption, what's gonna change after you build the app for real? So let's go back to, um, uh, let's, I have an app that's a social network for rock collectors, for, for geode enthusiasts, let's say. And it's an app just for people who really love pebbles and rocks and crystals. And I say, well, before I build this app and trust that 5,000 people will sign up, I'll see if I can get 5,000 people to join a geode discord that I'm starting. And if you're trying to do that and no one is joining your discord, then you're suddenly learning the cheap way that this idea is people are just not that into geodes or they don't want a social network for, for their geodes. Or if you're establishing your CAC and it comes back really bad, like you run 
a $500 Instagram campaign and you get five clicks. Now you've got a $100 CAC. And that means that you're not marketing this right. And that's not going to get better just because you actually go ahead and build out the whole app. Um, that would be a, a off ramp. I don't think of them as failures. I think of them as off ramps. You get off the highway at this stage because you're like, mm, this idea didn't land. Yeah, that, that that's that's a great point. I um, second second everything that you just said, Bill. So uh, let's see. How do you? Uh, another question from Lucy. How do you deal with fundraising when you are a lone person working within a startup? Does not having a team affect fundraising? It's a good question. It is. It, it is really important that in your pitch deck you have a slide that says who we are. That's a staple in every pitch deck. And if it's just you and you're the CEO, CTO, and CMO, you can still have advisors. And you can always fill out that who we are with your advisory board. Advisors usually cost 0.25% in equity. That's industry standard. They don't cost money money. They cost equity money. And just a quarter of a percent per advisor. So giving up only a percentage of your company, you can acquire four excellent advisors and you can use them to flesh out the who we are slide. And you can also add, uh, if you have a design development team in mind uh, that, you know, you, you know, what, that you're planning to engage after you raise the funding, you can also add them as a part of your team. You can say, this is our development team. This is our marketing team, right? So you can also include those um, third-party vendors uh, as your team, your you know design technology partners as well. So um, yeah, it, it's definitely good to show that you have team around you and you're not doing it in vacuum. Um, so question from Daniel, uh, would I also be able to talk uh, with you both outside of this to learn more about the technical stuff? I'm business finance major and I barely understand any of the terms that were said, but I want to learn this so that I can be of help to my future development team. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we do have a slide here. Um, so definitely feel free to reach out myself. Uh, and I would, Bill, if I speak for you, I, I'm sure Bill is open to connect as well to answer questions. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, you know, we love helping entrepreneurs and, uh, uh, people, uh, building products, get in the field. So, uh, definitely let us know what questions you may have. LinkedIn is the best way to get in touch with me. For me, email email would be the best if you um, send me an email. So already, wow, those a lot of great questions. Thank you, everybody. So, well, we're at the top of hour, so I guess we're safe to wrap it up. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Hope you learned a lot. Thank you, Bill. This was awesome.